You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Forgotten Narratives of Anzac History is often viewed through the eyes of the majority. Military history is no different. In this episode, I will ask about the others. The reality of the Anzacs has a multicultural dimension. This is often glossed over in the Anglo-Saxon dominated legend. My guest for this episode will explore the others. Dr. Sharon maskell Dare is a journalist, author, and military public affairs officer with a long-standing interest in the Anzac legend and how it is represented by the media today. Her PhD examined multicultural aspects of the legend and she's working with the South Australian state government throughout the Anzac centenary period to explore different ways of telling the Anzac story. Sharon, or Shazza as you like to be called, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me Mick. Firstly, what do you understand by the Anzac legend? What does the story mean to you? Well, interestingly, when I first started examining the Anzac legend 10 years ago now, um, I came at it with a very different perspective from the one I hold now. In the, the very first Anzac Day service I went to, I was in Singapore, and I was there doing some lecturing for the University of South Australia, and I happened to be there over Anzac Day. And one of my colleagues said, you have to go to the Anzac Day service, you have to go. And I found out that it was going to be held at the Cranji Commonwealth War Cemetery. And I remember getting up at the crack of dawn, going down into the lobby of my hotel, and there were these buses laid on, and there were all these Australians and New Zealanders who'd got up in the early hours of the morning, in the middle of the night, to go out to the cemetery to walk through the darkness the sound of the cicadas in the background. And there was this lone piper standing on the top of this enormous memorial that looks like the wings of an aircraft at Cranji. And there was a Maori haka that was performed. And we stood there in the half light and I was completely swept away by this sense of of something that I didn't truly understand. Coming from overseas, being a migrant to Australia, I'd recently got my Australian passport, my citizenship, my passport in my hand. And I vowed that day, if I want to be an Australian, I really need to try to understand what this story is about. And that put me on a journey that's lasted until today, where I've really tried to probe that question. What does the Anzac story mean to Australians and New Zealanders today? And also, what does it mean to me? Uh, that's interesting because this uh, took you to Gallipoli um, and from there you learnt a bit more about the Anzac legend that perhaps most uh, natural born uh, Australians have. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. My first journey there was back in uh, 2010 and I had the great good fortune to be able to attend the Anzac Day service that year and it really did change my perceptions of what I thought it was about in that prior to that I really had become quite intrigued by the um, scholarship around the legend, around media reactions to the legend, around the fact that so many Australians and New Zealanders felt this deep personal connection with the narrative and yet when I actually went to Gallipoli and I had the opportunity to hire a car and drive around the peninsula There was a day when I had something of an epiphany in that I went down to Cape Helles and I stood in front of that giant needle of stone pointing up into the sky. And as I looked at that memorial, I saw the number inscribed on its side. I don't remember the exact number, but it's more than 22,000 dead. 22,000. Whereas Australia, we lost 8,709. And I thought, I've been driving around the peninsula this week and I've seen so many Australians and New Zealanders paying homage at these cemeteries. But there's no one here, not at Cape Helles. I was the only person standing there at that memorial to more than 22,000 dead 
And that got me on a journey of thinking, what of the others? What of the allies? What of the Anzacs that we don't remember, who we don't think about? And that was what I wanted to look at through my research over the following years. And it wasn't, as you mentioned, just the British who were absent. Um, We talk about the others and missing narratives uh, replete throughout history. Um, We know that the victor of a war generally gets to write the history. Um, But then also the majority of that victorious side. Often uh, there are conscripts in an army. There are minorities that will fight for a a side, thinking that that will gain them uh, stronger political power within their own state. What else has your research revealed about the others and those missing from the mainstream Antac story? Well, in particular, that time that I visited Gallipoli back in 2010, and I went to the French cemetery, and very few people go there. And it's an incredible place in that the cemetery itself looks very different from the other cemeteries on the peninsula, in that the crosses in the graveyard there, they're iron crosses. Um, There's no white headstones, uh, though many of the the walls around the cemetery are white. So you have this stark, these, these stark, dark iron crosses against this brilliant white background. And I remember the sky that day was incredibly blue and it was very hot. And again, there were cicadas and they were beating away. And I actually went there indeed with my my radio gear. I have a background in radio journalism and I actually recorded the sound. It struck me as as quite mesmerising. And as I walked around that cemetery, I looked at some of the names, the names like Hamoud, and names that I didn't recognise as being European. And these were men from Senegal, these were men from Morocco, from Algeria, from French colonial Africa, who had fought on the Allied side. And yet we don't think about them in Australia. We don't think about their stories. And I remember there was, the gardener came out and he was so excited that somebody had come to his cemetery that he tended so carefully every day. And he came up to me and he said, Francaise, Francaise, are you French? He was so excited that a French person may have come to his cemetery. And I said to him, no, I'm Australian, which in itself was an interesting thing for me to say, given I'd only just got my Australian passport in the previous years. I didn't say I was British. Um, And just the look of utter disappointment on the poor man's face that there wasn't a French person who'd come to see him that day, that it was another Australian. And that again made me think that surely we we need to remember these men and we need to accord them the same courtesy and remembrance that we accord our own people, the Australians. And uh, in my research uh, on you, uh, apart from uh, finding out that uh, you've got a very impressive academic record, I was able to listen to one of your documentaries and you met a very interesting Australian student who was in Gallipoli at the time, um, I believe from Monash University. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about your conversation with her? Yes, it was was deeply affecting in that she would have been in her, I think her early 20s. Um, She was doing a bachelor's in um, Australian history. She was studying with uh, Professor Bruce Gates who um, I feel has done incredible work in this area and I have enormous respect for Bruce and for his wife, um, Professor Ray Francis. And um, interestingly, she was talking about how what had brought her to the Anzac story was not the narrative that prevails in Australia, the the, the narrative that was promulgated by um, C.E.W. Bean, by Charles Bean and through his work, important work, through the Australian War Memorial, but indeed also the legend that was originally coined um, by Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, the correspondent of the London Times, who who wrote that first day, of the first day, the 25th of April 1915, of the brave Anzac soldiers storming the heights as they uh, landed on the Gallipoli Peninsula. And she talked about how, for her, those weren't the narratives that she wanted to hear about, that what intrigued her was what was forgotten 
what was not there, what people don't think about. And she pointed out to me that close by there was the grave of a Gurkha soldier. There was the grave of an Indian soldier. And that fascinated me, that as a young Australian student, that she'd been perceptive in noticing that and in paying attention to that. And I think that also um, helped me on my journey in seeking to try to understand these narratives that we seem to have forgotten as we continue to tell and retell the Anzac story. It is interesting how uh, the young student was there, as you say, driven by uh, something other than the legend she probably grew up with. We know that there were, as you said, Indian, uh, Gurkha, Sikh, uh, French troops who were our allies. Um, and we also know that if you go and see the iconography of uh, the Australian Anzac legend, often it's a chiseled jawed, uh, redhead tinged uh, Aussie with a freckled face, uh, comes straight from the outback, uh, probably taking his same horse that he had in outback Queensland straight on to the ship, straight over to Gallipoli to fight. It's not exactly the truth of the matter, and this Anglo-Saxon legend hides uh, what I have called the others uh, today. What about the Anzacs themselves? I mean, the Dardanelles campaign wasn't solely about the Anzacs, but that's the biggest legend that's risen up. So what were the Anzacs, who were the Anzacs, and you know, who were the others of the Anzacs? Well, there were, there were country boys from the bush, there's no question, of course there were. But there were also Chinese Anzacs, there were also German Anzacs, there were Russian Anzacs, and importantly, there were Indigenous Australian Anzacs too. And of course, there were New Zealander Anzacs, there were Maori Anzacs, and interestingly as well, there were Indian Anzacs. Research has revealed in recent years that in fact there was an Indian unit that was attached directly to Anzac Corps, that was the 7th Indian Mounted Artillery Brigade that was actually part of Anzac Corps. And yet the stories of those Indian soldiers is only now being told. And in fact, Professor Peter Stanley from ADFA has done some very important work in highlighting their stories. So it's interesting how through the Anzac centenary commemoration period, we've now woken up to the fact that the Anzacs were a lot more multicultural than perhaps we always thought they were. And it's important that we're now telling those stories. In light of telling uh, those stories, I'm now going to invite you to tell a story. Not a bedtime story though, listeners, so stay awake. I'd ask uh, Sharon now uh, to tell us the tale of Billy Singh. Well, Billy Singh was known as the Gallipoli Sniper. So you have to imagine this uh, young man who was of mixed uh, parentage. Um, one of his parents was Chinese. Um, and he went to Gallipoli and he was quite the most incredible shot. And if you've ever been to the Gallipoli Peninsula and you've ever walked the battlefields, you've ever walked that landscape, you'll know only too well that it's a landscape made for snipers. It truly is. It's, there are so many gullies, there are so many precipices, there are so many places where a sniper can position themselves. And that's exactly what Billy Singh did. And he had a confirmed number of kills, which was 150 confirmed kills. But there's speculation he may have had up to 300 kills. And in fact, he was such a problem to the, to the enemy. He was such a problem that they even had their own sniper called Abdul the Terrible, who was assigned to wipe Billy Singh out. And the story goes that one day, Abdul the Terrible had Billy Singh in his sights. But Billy Singh had Abdul in his sights and he took the shot first and he killed Abdul the Terrible. And the legend goes on in that in 1916, Billy Singh was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. He was later deployed to the Western Front. In fact, after a debilitating bout of influenza, he got very sick, but he ended up on the Western Front. He was deployed there in 1917. He was awarded the Belgian Croix de Guerre. He um, had a, um, a relationship with a, a Scottish nurse. Um, he ended up back in Australia after the war. And then that was when things really started to turn for the worse for Billy Singh, in that he was given a plot of land to try to turn into something fruitful. It didn't work out for him. 
and he struggles into ill health and old age. And then he died alone in 1943 in a boarding house in Brisbane. And apparently all he had left were five shillings. It's a terribly, terribly sad story, a story of somebody who should have been part of Australia's um, proud military heritage in terms of the incredible achievements that he had as a, as a soldier, as, as an incredible individual. And yet it's only now, as part of the Anzac centenary, that Billy Singh's story is, is being retold and it's being rediscovered. And in fact, um, within the centenary period, a new memorial has been um, has been consecrated to him at Lutwich Cemetery in Brisbane, the Billy Singh Memorial. So he's now getting the recognition that he deserves. It's quite a sad tale, the tale of Billy Singh, and you know the life of him on the front uh, kind of sounds a bit like some of the Hollywood movies. No doubt, uh, Jude Law would probably be picked to play him again and would miss the most important part about his heritage. Uh, not that that's a critique on any movie that gives every Russian a British accent. Now we're starting to hear a bit about Indigenous Anzacs and I talked a bit before about political legitimacy being something that motivated uh, minorities to fight uh, for a country. Now Indigenous people at this point in time didn't have constitutional rights in Australia but there were Indigenous Anzacs, there were Indigenous men who signed to go to war uh, for the Commonwealth. Can you tell me a little bit about the Indigenous Anzacs? Well, their stories are now very much part of the Anzac centenary commemoration period after, uh, after many years of not getting the recognition they deserve. And in fact, um, in South Australia, where, where I'm based, in Adelaide, there have been significant efforts to try to give them the recognition that's warranted. And in fact, Adelaide was the first capital city in Australia to have the first dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander War Memorial. And it was incredible to see that opened as part of the Anzac Centenary Commemoration period. And in fact, I had the good fortune to, to go along. I was making a documentary for the BBC at the time and I went along when they were actually constructing the statues and that actually found um, a local Indigenous girl and, and a local Indigenous boy and um, dressed them up in these, um, you know, historic costumes. And they had them standing on this big rock and they had the artist there trying to sort of fashion, you know, her drawings and, and her getting ready for her sculpture as a result of, of looking at the figures in, in front of her. So it was, it was quite an incredible process they went to to, to try to, to make that memorial as meaningful as possible. And what's happened as a result of, of that whole awakening in South Australia and, and indeed nationally is that so many stories are now coming to light. And there's one in particular that I think is important. That's of um, Arthur Walker, who was from the Ramanjeri people um, around the Victor Harbour area in South Australia, south of Adelaide. And um, he landed on the first day of the Gallipoli landings um, on the peninsula with the 10th Battalion and um, went on to serve on the Western Front, where indeed he died. And his family felt such a sense of importance around remembering his story that in every generation since, one of the boys is called Anzac. And as part of the documentary that, that I recorded around this subject for the BBC a couple of years ago now, I had the good fortune to, to actually meet the current Anzac, who at that time was 12 years old, was a fantastic footballer, very proud of being able to carry that name. And um, yeah, I mean, for that family, it's, it's been very, very, very important. In fact, the former Chief of Army, um, Lieutenant General David Morrison, came to Victor Harbour a couple of years ago and um, was part of a ceremony where the local Ram and Jerry people presented him with a kangaroo skin warrior cloak. And it was a very moving ceremony. I had the, the, the good fortune to be the public affairs officer or one of the public affairs officers on duty that day. And um, I remember that there was um, a number of rituals associated with the ceremony, um, including some traditional dancing. And um, I remember that there were the relatives of Arthur Walker there 
and um, the chief of army, had, had, uh, the former chief of army, had had this beautiful plaque um, uh, made up for them that he presented to them about Arthur Walker's story. And I know to them that that meant a lot to get that recognition today. It's quite touching to know that the recognition is coming. Um, it has taken its time, but as you said, the community is still maintaining that recognition, uh, particularly with the fifth generation, I think. Uh, and Zach going through his teenage years now playing footy. Uh, hopefully he'll join uh, the Essendon Bombers rather than any of the teams in South Australia. The Bombers actually need the help and all the help they can get at the moment. As much as it is fun to take the mickey out of our trans-Tasman uh, neighbours and being a Tasmanian, I do enjoy uh, having a poke at the, the islands off to our east. We also tend to ignore the Kiwi uh, or New Zealander uh, contribution. Why is that? Oh, look, I think it's a, a case that inevitably, you know, with something like the Anzac story, because and this has been well covered by historians, it's become something of a foundation story uh, for Australia. It's become something that people feel deeply attached to, feel a sense of national identity around. In recent years, that has been questioned, that has been debated. There's um, a bit more realism, I think, now around discussion of what the Anzac legend truly does mean. Um, Interestingly, it's now being called a myth not so much a legend. There are some historians that are leading the debate on that. But as part of that, there has been a mission of the New Zealander narrative. There's no question about that. that It has been left out. And interestingly, that's one reason why some people argue that when you write the word ANZAC, it should be capitalised so that the NZ gets some kind of due recognition. I would actually take issue with that because ANZAC is in the Macquarie Dictionary and, and has been around as a word that's lowercase with a capital A ever since World War I. The, the RSL would disagree with me. And indeed, if you speak to New Zealanders, they're all very comfortable with ANZAC with a small NZ. They don't have an issue with that aspect of it. But certainly they do have an issue with the fact that in Australia, when the story is told, that their contribution is often left out. And I think importantly also the fact that there was the contribution not just of New Zealanders, but of their Maori and South Pacific Islander peoples. The fact that there's been a lot of work done in New Zealand. There's one historian, James Cowan, who's done some excellent work talking about the strength of the Maori contingent at Gallipoli. As he describes, there were 16 officers and um, 461 um, other ranks. And yet we don't hear about them. Um, So it's important, I think, that as we continue to go through this commemoration period in Australia, that we do try to remember the others, as as you call them, Mick. You know, the, the forgotten narratives of Anzac, they do matter and they do need to be included and they do need to be told. And just for our listeners, I was uh, squarely on the uh, all capitalisation side until I went through the uh, media style guide for Anzac Day commemorations, actually authored by uh, Sharon. And I'm now squarely in the Macquarie Dictionary side Uh, because the Macquarie Dictionary is the official dictionary of my employer, so I cannot disagree with it. Sharon, at the end of that last uh, answer, you talked about uh, the importance of remembering the others. What needs to be done to change uh, people's perceptions? How do we correct uh, the historical record? Well, this is where I'm going to declare my bias. Fact is, I'm a journalist by training. And I feel that the role of the media in terms of shaping public perception and public understanding of something as important as the Anzac narrative cannot be underestimated. And that's one of the reasons why, as part of my PhD work, I wrote the Anzac Day Media Style Guide, which you know is, is free, that we put out through the RSL every year, where we are trying to put that message out to journalists you know, tell this story accurately. Don't just buy into the cliche. Don't buy into the narrative that's been told time and again, year on year, that's not necessarily true. Ask some of those questions. Look at some different ways of of talking about this story and understanding it and look for those forgotten narratives. Because, I mean, the key thing with journalism is it's meant to be about novelty, about 
truth about um, diversity, about education. I mean, the, the role of journalism is not just to entertain, it's meant to be inform and educate. And the Anzac narrative is a case in point where the media have an incredible role to play in, in getting that message out there. And the fact is, is that in Australia, we, we have so many wonderful historians here and scholars who've done fantastic work in this area. And yet so much of their work doesn't necessarily filter out to the wider public. And that's where, you know, journalists can make a difference. That's my view. And I think with uh, the extremely large listenership that this show has, uh, we're taking one more step towards correcting that historical record. Now, Sharon, every guest on the show answers the same final question. You are no different perhaps a little shorter than the other guests, but that's actually not relevant. I just wanted to say that. What is relevant is whether you can, despite your stature, finish the sentence, war is. War is? In my view, a construct. War is a construct. And the reason I say that is because from all the people I've interviewed and particularly in my work with the Australian Army as a public affairs officer. War is a word that can never, never accurately portray the enormity, the horror, the complexity, the messiness of war. And as a result, it's something that we imagine. It's a word that we think we understand. It's a word that we attach to certain concepts, certain ideas. But in the end, it really is nothing more than a construct. It cannot stand for the brute, enormous reality that it seeks to represent. Well, it's a little longer than 140 characters for Twitter, so uh, you fail uh, on that. No, uh, that is a good answer. You do not have to reset the final question. Uh, Sharon, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Mick. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Uh, For those that aren't on Twitter, Sharon and I have been collaborating on a project for the Australian Army. Uh, We're both currently uh, in the middle of South Australia on uh, the Australian Army's capstone exercise, Exercise Hamill. And uh, Sharon has been producing an excellent uh, podcast. I can say this because uh, it's part of my work. The podcast is the Australian Army Training and Doctrine Podcast. And it is uh, a way of explaining... Uh, to the general public, the training that the Australian Army conducts in its mission to achieve a professional excellence. It's in its inaugural season at the moment, and it is focusing on uh, this exercise being the capstone exercise for the year. You can check it out on iTunes and SoundCloud. Uh, Please uh, feel free to download it after you've downloaded this show, of course, although you wouldn't be hearing this if you hadn't downloaded the show. And As always, uh, please stop by iTunes, take those five stars out of your pocket and give them to the dead Prussian. Until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode as well as copyright information can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.